Hello again, welcome back everyone. Liquor Hound here with you and thank you for joining me once again for another spirit review video. Now, a lot of times when I'm shooting my reviews, some people will see bottles on my shelves and they'll ask me, you know, well, what are those like? And even though they're whiskeys of the past and pretty much super hard to get, uh, I don't usually like to do those reviews just because I know they're so hard to get. Uh, but I got asked about these and I thought, you know what? I know with the rarity and the sometimes the hype that Japanese whiskeys can drive, uh, the pricing can go really crazy. So I thought, you know what? A good video would be for me to break these three out. And these are the Habikis, the 12 year old, the 17 and the 21. And just kind of taste them side by side, give you my impressions of them, let you know how they stand as far as like, cause I have a good gauge of like where single malts are and where they've been and like, is this gonna fit really a super, you know, premium level of character? Or is this just gonna be something that was like, ah, oh, it was cool for the past, but you can probably get this profile in this way or that way. So that's kind of what I'm gonna do today. And we're gonna, again, take a look at the Habiki 12. They're, all these are 43 percenters. They're not really big ABVs, so 86 proof. Uh, the 12 was discontinued, I wanna say around 2015, that was gone. Now we have the Habiki Harmony and so on. Um, I just want to go ahead and give you my impression so that you can know if you see these in a bar, they're really worth paying, you know, $100, $200 an ounce. We're going to find out. So, Habiki 12-year-old, on the nose, and all these have been argon gassed on my shelves, and I don't move them very often because behind them are just some other Japanese whiskeys like the, I remember the Nika Pure Malts and the Yamazaki 12 and 18s are back there, and I don't get to them very often, so. And I haven't nosed or tasted these in probably... I don't know, five years. So here we go. On the nose, Habiki 12. All right. It brings back some core memories here of the Habiki 12. Just lots of brown sugar caramel, honey drizzled pears. In that sense, it kind of reminds me of Balvenie. There is a little bit of like a cherry cherry blossom type aspect to it a little floral in with that fruit good amount of oak a little hint of like a leather tone and that's about it on that it's pretty pure pretty simple but again back in the day this was 50 dollars, right you're not expecting a ton for that and here we go we'll taste it That's really good. It's not as, I was going to say, it is very similar to Bavini. So if you're looking at a, not like the current 12, almost like a 15 year Bavini, something in that line is what this kind of tastes like. Caramel sweetness, brown sugar right behind that. That honeyed, malt honeyed pear territory is right there behind it. Wisp of smoke. So a very moderate amount of, I mean, a very tiny amount of peat was probably in one of these components. Orange, a little bit of like the dried orange peels are in here. Leather. That cherry that's in it is kind of a cherry, cherry blossom hybrid. So I really like that floral mixed with that cherry, that little bit of plum. That nice oak and nice leather. There's a lot of leather on it. I was going to say the one thing that is the only thing it's missing from some of the old Balvenies is a little bit of like a waxiness that those sometimes got. And wax, you think candle wax, that type thing. It's that smell of a candle wax. It's, it comes across on palate. Sometimes it, well, a lot of times it come across on some really good Klein leash, but on those old Bavinis that were there. And this kind of has a lot of Bavini characteristic without the wax. And with a little peat, which is unusual. Short of that peat week. All right. Really nice. It lingers for a very long time. It's sweet and rich, medium viscosity, maybe a touch over. So for a 12 year old for $50, it was a great, great drinker. 
Now, additional five years at least of maturation, because again, the numeric age statement is always the youngest whiskey in the blend. There might very well be 20, 25-year-old single grain components in here, but the youngest being 17. All right, on the nose. All right, much more fruit. This one, I can really pick up a lot of that plum and they're baked down with brown sugar. That cherry is still in there, but again, they're starting to feel baked, cooked down, condensed. They're starting to get jammy. Cherry and plums still in these. Lots of resinous oat coming through on the nose. Some polish. A little bit of that touch of that almost like a malt vinegar in this one. But it's very, uh, just a touch, like not a lot. Really, really nice. All right, let's taste it. Mm. Wow. Again, sweet and rich. This one almost feels like it's heading into medium high viscosity brown sugar caramel there is a light nuttiness to it that shows up mid palate but uh, brown sugar caramel you get that kind of plum a little bit of even a date in this one that real light cherry that light plums are in here everything feels a little more delicate as far as the fruit not the the overall weight of the whiskey is much more dense than the 12. Yeah, nice baking spices on that mid palate. You do get a little bit of that dried orange peel in this one. The It's almost like there's more sherried malt in this one. Because I'm picking up a little more of that date, that fig, plum... Almost strawberry element in this one. Baked apples. That honeyed pear thing is still in here. That leathery oak on that back end. Very, very solid whiskey from there. Does it remind me of some single malt scotch? Of course. Which ones? Hmm. Maybe a little bit of like a older Imperial. A touch of that kind of cocoa leather from like a Milton Duff. You don't pull a lot of single grain character in these as far as um, being too heavy handed, meaning there's still some of that kind of sweet, you know, rich elements of an old single grain in them, but they're not out of balance. All right, now we're heading into the Habiki 21. Oh, here we go. Hmm. Let me go back to this real quick. Yeah. Okay. It is, everything is very linear. It's a similar blend, almost like they're using the same distilleries is just because there's a little twinge of peat in this one as well but you can tell everything's just a little more mature every time there's more peat on this one than there was even on the 17. more on the brown sugar than the caramel spectrum but you still get that plums dates Cherries, brandied cherries in this one. Fig. That kind of floral, light floral. But again, with that amount of cherry, that plum, it does come off a little cherry blossom-ish. Very, very enjoyable. But again, much more heavy on the oak. And let's taste it. Mm. Oh, 
for 43%. That's the amazing thing on all of these. 43%, they do drink very rich for that proof. Now, price point wise, between the 17 and 21, the thing that you're going to get here is a little more on the darker spectrum. As far as the brown sugar, as far as the oak is heavier, the leather is a little heavier, but also that bitterness of that kind of oak is a little heavier. It almost comes off like pecan now. You're starting to pick up a little bit of that light pecan nuttiness. The peat's heavier. You can definitely pick up that peat smoke in this one. But it's a beautiful whiskey. I mean, the malt character, that honeyed malt weight throughout the line is there. The figs, again, a little denser in the 21. That orange oil that I was picking up, almost like dried orange peels here, is orange oil in this one. I almost... Personally, I almost wish they backed off that peat in this one just a smidge. I enjoy it because I love peated malts. But that's the only thing that makes this one feel a touch disjointed from the 17 and 12 is the that little heavy-handed on that on this one. So as long as you like peat, you're going to be fine. If you don't like peat at whiskeys, stay away from the 21. My favorite of the line, though, I think I'm going to be the 17 year. I just find it the best balance of all three. So basically, to summarize, I guess the Habikis are a very nice and unique whiskey to experience. Do I think you need to be out personally, you know, seeking each and every one of these? Of course not. If you have crazy money and you're like, you know what, I want something that nobody else has, knock yourself out. But Coming from my experience in the Scotch world, can you use this money and apply it towards single cask expressions that are cast strength Scottish malts at 10 to 15 years old that will dominate these? You can. Um, but again, as far as flavor profile, as I was trying to explain this to somebody, I would say the best way to experience these is to get yourself, like again, above any 15 or a Balvenie 17, 16, somewhere in there, and get that flavor profile, and then taste, uh, let's say, Johnny Walker Green Label or Blue Label to get that kind of little bit of slight peat in with that blended malt characteristic. You get those two flav flavor profiles together, you pretty much have what these are. So anyway, I hope that helps a little bit. Of course, if you enjoy this kind of unbiased, straightforward content, please consider joining me over at patreon.com slash liquorhound, where you're going to get these videos two weeks early. You're going to get them ad-free. There's going to be tier giveaways, a private review library, and so on. But if you can't and you're just joining me here on YouTube, I greatly appreciate each and every one of you. Thank you, as always, for all your great comments. Keep leaving them. Everyone have a great day, and cheers.